Hey everybody, Ryan Jackson here. Hope you're having a wonderful day. We're going to jump into Article 120, which used to be Article 220, which covers your branch circuit feeder and service load calculations. Now, when I'm teaching a code changes class, I try not to spend too much time in Article 220. Uh, load calculations are, are very important. They're critical, right? You have to do a load calculation before you do much of anything, right? If you're adding a load, if you're wiring a new building. Uh, but I also understand they're not the funnest thing to talk about, right? And they're not the funnest thing to hear about. So I try to cover load calculations when I really feel like I need to cover a change that's important. And boy, for the 2026 edition, there's a lot of those. <laughs> we moved Article 220 over to Article 120. And if that's all we did, I wouldn't even be talking about it, right? We reorganize articles all the time. But man, I'm here to tell you, in the 2026, we did a bunch of stuff to the load calculations article. Uh, so many that I'm actually, I, I'm not going to be able to cover them all, right? We're going to do 100 different topics in 100 days. And I have to pick and choose what we're going to cover. So there are some things in Article 120 that I think are important uh, that we're not going to talk about in this series of videos. Uh, you know, using a power control system, for example, we'll kind of hit on it. Uh, read 120.7. We're not going to do a whole video on it because it, it kind of said that in the 2023, and we just kind of revised it in the 2026. And I think uh, there might be some stuff about hospitals. You know, if that's your cup of tea, you'll want to make sure you read 120.110 and 120.111. Uh, but for the rest of us, we're not going to cover every single thing that happened in Article 120. So let's go ahead and jump into it though. Article 120, branch circuit feeder and service load calculations. 120.5 calculations, new voltage system was added and multiple clarifications were made. All right, so 120.5a voltages. Unless indicated otherwise, voltages include 120, 12240, 12208, 240, 240 slash 416, which is new, 277, 480, 347, 347, 600, and 600. All right, so if you're in the United States and you're watching this, not too likely that you're going to see 347, 600. 347, 600 is very common in Canada. It's basically what they use instead of 277, 480. Uh, and, you know, again, you, you leave the United States, you're going to see some of these and you might not see other ones. But we added a new voltage here, 240 slash 416. And obviously that's a three-phase voltage. If you've never heard of it, well, it's not too common here in the States, at least not yet. But where you'll see 240 slash 416 is actually in the bit mining world. So if you're into cryptocurrency and you're doing those installations, 240 slash 416 is an international voltage and they use it for cryptocurrency mining. So there you go. Um, now you could also use it for other applications. Right? You buy an equipment from overseas that operates at 416 volts, well, you're going to have to provide 416 volts. So anyway, this, uh, this section just tells us what some of the common voltages are and the voltages that we use here in Article 120. They also added an informational note that says for DC systems, voltage is often expressed as a nominal value and a wide voltage band. If the system has a wide voltage band, both the high and low ends of that band should be taken into account. All right, so as we've already discussed in some of these videos, we're really trying to talk more about direct current in the 2026 NEC because we're seeing more and more of it, right? Um, 20 years ago, when we would talk about DC, it was, you know, typically you'd create DC on your roof and then you would change it over to AC, right? Anytime you change from AC to DC or DC to AC, there's going to be losses involved. So why, if you're going to have DC at your building because you've got an energy storage system or, you know, photovoltaic or what have you, why change it to AC and then change it back to DC for powering up LED lights? Why not just make DC, distribute DC, and utilize DC? So there's a lot more emphasis on DC. And we're clarifying here that sometimes we express DC as a band, right? Here in this picture, it says 50 to 57 volts DC. 
So we need to consider both the lower end and the higher end. It's still Ohm's law, right? Ohm's law doesn't lie, so as far as the, the power is concerned. Uh, but, you you know, if, if you've got something small like this, a little 50 watt load, probably not going to make a difference. Uh, if you have a big piece of equipment and it has a wide voltage band and you might be delivering those voltages to it, then it's something that you need to consider. 120.5B, Ampere Fractions. Now, I, I got to be honest here. Um, I would love to tell you that this is a general rule found in Article 90 or found in Article 110, and I think it should be, but it's not. So we need to bear that in mind here when we read this rule. Load calculations, and, and you can see the underlying text there. That's what they're really trying to clarify. Article 120 is load calculations. That's it right? Doesn't tell you how to size circuits and what size wire and what size breaker. This is just the load calculation. Load calculations can be rounded to the nearest whole ampere and decimals smaller than 0 0.5 can be dropped. All right, so we take a look at this piece of equipment here. It's, uh, it's a 10,000 watt load at single phase 277. So we divide 10,000 by 277 volts and that is 36.1 so that means it for the purposes of the load calculation it, you might be able to drop the one tenth of an amp now I, I want to be really careful in how I say that because the code doesn't tell you when to drop the ampere and, and what I mean by that is at what point in the calculation do you drop fractions of an ampere in my opinion you should probably only do that at the final answer to the problem, right? If you've got 10 of these things, 36.1, 36.1, 36, I don't think you can drop the point 0.1 10 different times. I think you would add all 10 of them together, and then at that product, you would drop the fraction of an ampere, right? So I don't want to. I don't want to say that you get to drop you know, half of an amp off of every single load in the building. I think it's done at the, at the end of your mathematical problem. But let's say that this is the end of the mathematical problem. For the purposes of the load calculation, 36.1 is 36. But for sizing the branch circuit, here's where you've got to be super careful because it's so easy to get this wrong. For the branch circuit, if the load is continuous, the conductors and overcurrent protective device are sized at 125% of that, right? So you would take your 36.1 times 1.25, and that means 45.125 amperes. Now here's, here's what I think kind of sucks. You don't get to drop that fraction of an amp. Your wire does not have to be sized at 45 amps. It has to be sized at 45.1 amps. Your breaker... Could you put that on a 45 amp breaker? The answer is no. You have to put that on a 50 amp breaker because the breaker has to be sized not smaller than 45.1. You don't get a drop that one tenth of an amp because that's not a load calculation, right? The load calculation is what you do in article 120, not what you do in article 210, not what you do in article 240, 215, any of those. So that's not new. That has always been the case, but they're really trying to emphasize because emphasize the fact because a lot of people have, have got it wrong, and I used to get it wrong, right? I used to think that you could just delete the 0 0.1 amps, and like I said, I think you should be able to, but it doesn't matter what I think. The code says you can only do this when you're doing a load calculation. Let's keep reading. <clears throat> 120.5c, floor area. Floor area is based on the outside dimensions of the building or area, for dwelling units, open porches, detached garages, and areas that are not adaptable for future habitable or occupiable space are not counted. All right, man, I hate using AI drawings like this, but I don't have a good drone overhead picture of a house with a detached garage. So you're doing the calculation for the dwelling. You're going to look at the square footage of the dwelling, and you're gonna plug in the correct number for the uh, for the square footage and you're going to do the dwelling unit load calculation there this little detached garage is not part of the dwelling 
right? So when you're sizing the dwelling unit and you're doing the demand factors and all of that stuff, the reason that we have it all figured out for dwelling units is because there's a million of them, right? And they're all fairly close to the same. They've all got a kitchen and a bathroom and, you know, bedrooms and what have you. But when you start throwing things like detached garages into the mix, we don't know what you're doing with your detached garage. Um, my garage, it's full of tools, right? I like to do woodworking and different stuff like that. Well, my, my neighbor's garage, it's also full of tools, but he's an auto mechanic. So most of his tools are like you know, pneumatic. He's got an air compressor, but the rest of it's not electrical loads. Me, everything in my garage is an electrical load. Someone else, they may use their garage for storage and they don't have any electrical load in there, right? So we don't count the detached garage as part of the dwelling unit because it's not part of the dwelling unit, right? We don't count open porches. So looking at this picture, I do not need to count the area underneath that covered porch, right? I do not count <clears throat> the detached garage. And I do not count areas that are not adaptable for future habitable or occupiable space. If this house has a basement, you count the basement. Even if it's unfinished, because it could be finished in the future and turned into habitable or occupiable space. What you do not count would be a crawl space. You can't turn a crawl space into habitable space right? And three foot ceiling or something. So you count unfinished basements. You don't count crawl spaces. You count attached garages. You don't count detached garages. By the way, counting the attached garage, new to the 2023 NEC. 120.5D, <laughs> DC loads. As I mentioned before, we're talking more and more about DC. Now, this picture is so beautiful, you think it's a drawing from AI. This is actually my friend uh, Bob up in New Hampshire. Uh, he did this solar installation. He put his drone up in the air and took this picture. What, a, what an amazing picture of, uh, of a New England autumn, you know, all the different colors of the trees and everything. But anyway, I, I digress here. I get hypnotized by the, uh, by the changing colors of the trees. For DC equipment, Watts and volt amperes are considered the same. Uh, yeah, because there, there is no real and apparent power like there is in AC for DC. With DC, uh, you know, power factor is unity, right? There, there's, no, <laughs> there, there's nothing to get out of phase with, right, with, with DC. So with DC, watts and VA are considered one and the same. And, and I think that was probably the way we calculated it. I mean, how else would you calculate it? But the code didn't say that. They also added a section here, and I, I think this is great. Continuous loads do not need to be calculated at 125% for load calculations in Article 120. Now, again, that has always been the case as well, but enough people get this wrong that they wanted to add it specifically into the code. We did the example a minute ago right, with the 10,000 watt 277 volt load. And I said, you gotta size that at 125% for the wire, 125% for the breaker. Well, those rules are found in 210.19 for the wire and 210.20 for the breaker, right? And if it was a feeder, it would be 215.2 and 215.3. So the 125% continuous load, search for that in Article 120. Search, search the term continuous load. We, we don't really get into continuous loads because whether the load is on for three hours, three minutes, or three months, it doesn't change what the load truly is, okay? If this electric vehicle supply equipment, let's say that pulls 48 amps. Well, that's the load. It, it pulls 48 amps. When I'm doing the load calculation, it, it's 48 amps. Now, we'll talk more about electric vehicles and how we do the load calculations a little bit later, but the reality of it is, whatever the load is, that is the load when it comes to the load calculation. The 125% uh, for continuous loads, why do we do that? Well, we do that because of how we test equipment, right? How we test circuit breakers mainly. Circuit breakers, generally speaking, are not really designed for continuous operation at 100% of their rating. In other words, if I have a 40 amp breaker, I really shouldn't put 40 amps on it for three consecutive hours or longer. It will probably trip, 
So if you have a continuous load, you have to size the continuous load at 125%. That way your breaker is going to be bigger and it won't trip. But none of that has to do with the load calculation. The load calculation, you use the actual load, not the load times 125%. All right, so continuous loads do not need to be calculated at 125% when you're doing the load calculations in Article 120. Very, very common misunderstanding of the code. They also add an informational note here that says multiplying loads by 125% could be needed for reasons other than continuous loading. A motor, right? The motor needs to start. So you might have to size the wires at 125% and different things, right? So sometimes we do have to size things at 125% that's not necessarily for continuous loading. Uh, the conductors and overcurrent protective device typically are sized at 125% for continuous, for continuous load, but the load itself does not change. So when we do a load calculation, we use the real load, right? Now, of course, when we're doing things like lighting calculations, we have to look at the square footage, right, and do the load calculations that way. When we're sizing the branch circuits, we go to two, 120, <laughs> I'm already saying 220, 120.14, A through K, if I'm not mistaken, and it gives you the specific things. Here's a, uh, a pop quiz for you guys. Here are a bunch of lamp holders. I counted them earlier, there's 26 of them, all on the same circuit. <laughs> now this is at a uh, coffee shop in New Orleans that I stopped at. It was, it was a great coffee shop. The people there were fantastic. I had a, uh, what are those things called in New Orleans? The little, uh, uh, what are they called? The, the doughy biscuit kind of things with all the powdered sugar. God, they're good. Ben, beignets, I think. But anyway, 26 lamp holders. Those are not what we call heavy duty lamp holders. Heavy duty lamp holders are typically a mogul base, right? Like you'd see for a metal halide lamp. Uh, so those are not heavy duty lamp holders. How do you calculate the load for that circuit? And do you think they did a calculation for that? Well, the answer is those are actually sized at 180 VA per outlet. So 180 VA times 26 is gonna be, I think, 39 amps. So I'm guessing they probably didn't do a calculation on that. Now, does that actually pull 39 amps? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, that's probably how they should have done the math. All right, so there's our first video on the new Article 120 for load calculations. We're going to do more videos on load calculations because we've done a lot of changes recently, really starting with the 2020 code. You know, the 2020 code, they went back and they looked at all the different lighting load calculations and realized that maybe they were a little bigger than they needed to be now that we're no longer using incandescent lamps or even fluorescent lamps. You know, very often we're using LED. So lots of changes in the load calculations, but really I, I think they're good. Almost all of them are going to help you. They're not going to hurt you. They're actually going to reduce the load calculations that we would have done three years ago, 30 years ago, you know. So I hope you'll join me. I hope you enjoyed this video. On the next one, we're going to talk about 120.6, which is non-coincident loads. And I love what they did in that section. Really nice clarifications. So we'll see you on the next video, and I hope you have a great day. See ya.